Welcome to our webinar on the obedient and happy child. So in this webinar we're going to talk about how to set limits that kids will respect without using punishments or bribes. So to get the most out of this webinar it's best if you take notes because I'm going to be going through a lot of information. So what you're going to learn are the three rules about setting limits that you should always follow to gain and keep your child's respect. The other thing you're going to learn is why punishments and bribes are the least effective way to get kids to cooperate. You're going to learn simple communication tricks that get kids to listen and pay attention without fear. The real secret to having children respect you and the biggest mistake most parents make when it comes to teaching kids boundaries. How can we get our children to be obedient and cooperative and less defiant and rebellious and resistant to the rules and the limits that we're trying to set for them? The key to make this happen is in their level of respect, their level of, in respect for us, in our word and the limits that we set. And this is determined by how we set limits and how we respond to our child when they test the limits. Okay? So there's two parts here. How we set them to begin with and the important thing to remember is that any healthy child will inevitably test our limits. This is a very natural thing for them to do. Now in my book Democratic Parenting I have an entire chapter on setting limits. The reason why I wanted to do one of these live webinars is that setting limits is perhaps one of the most misunderstood skills of democratic parenting, or really any style of parenting. And it's, it's an area where a lot of parents have difficulties uh, because their children simply don't respect the limits they try to set. And often it's because of how they set them and how they respond to their child when the child tests the limits. In my book I talk about how it's very natural and healthy for children to test their, their, their limits. It's a way for children to learn and to grow and to test their own ideas against the world around them by testing the limits that we set or the limits in the classroom or anywhere in their world. It's a very natural thing and that's how evolution happens. That's how growth and learning happens. So we, we don't want to raise robot kids who never test our limits because there would be something wrong with that child if they didn't test them. It's quite natural for them to do so. It's in how we respond to them that will determine whether or not they respect the limits and that they're going to uh, learn where those limits are in their behavior and in the circumstances. So there are three rules I'm going to talk about about setting limits that kids respect. The first one is in using connective communication when we set limits. This has to do with being kind and patient yet firm at the same time. The second rule is never, ever, ever, ever let a child trample your limits. Okay, this is a key point that I see a lot of parents having trouble with. And the third limit, the third rule is to understand that whoever has the greatest will wins. Okay, so let's go through these in greater detail. These are the three rules. The first rule about using connective communication. For those of you who have my book, Democratic Parenting, who, or who perhaps have, um, have, have done my ADHD program or my parent leadership program, you'll see I talk a bit more about com connective communication in those courses or in my book. But I'm going to give you some of the outline here um, on some of the important points of using connective communication and why it's so powerful and effective. So when you use connect connective communications, you want to be kind and patient and loving, okay, yet firm and unwavering. So that's the balance. Connective communication is all about using words and the way of speaking and communicating that builds the connection between the child and the adult. The tone of your voice is everything. And you may need to explain the reason for the limit while when, you, when you're setting that limit, you might need to tell them why that limit is there, right? For example, if you have a toddler who comes inside 
um, and forget to take their boots off and um, brings mud all over the floor, right? You need to set that limit. You need to stop them and explain to them why you don't want them uh, trucking mud all over the floor, okay? So, uh, so we have a great question here. What if they don't agree with the explanation, okay? That's just fine. The important thing is to hold your ground. Not agreeing with their explanation is part of them testing the limits, okay? And that's a part of uh, what we're going to talk about the third rule is whoever has the strongest will wins. And if you maintain your poise, if you maintain your patience, and you maintain this connective communication, they will respect you. The thing is, you need to stay firm and unwavering. If your limit makes sense, okay, if you can back it up with logic and, and rationale, they will, they, they will follow it inevitably. Now, there are times when a child is overburdened with stress, with, uh, with hurts, and they're just not thinking clearly. They're emotional, they're needy because of unmet needs and other reasons. Uh, maybe there's some ag just aggressive uh, tendencies that are built up into them. Maybe they're angry or upset about something else that's bothering them, and they'll just be uh, defiant and oppositional. In that case, uh, and at that, that point, you'll set a different kind of limit, right? And we'll talk about that in greater detail as we continue into this webinar about the different circumstances that we run into as parents when we're trying to set limits because there's so many of them. But this is going to give you a framework of how to apply these rules and how to apply the democratic parenting skills no matter what the situation is so the child will learn to respect your limits. Now, as you learn to set these limits and you stick with them and follow these principles here, your child will test them less and less and less because their respect for you and their respect for your word and their respect for the limits that you set is going to increase. As that increases, their level of defiance and resistance will decrease at the same time. With a very young children, they might not understand the reason for some of the, the limits that you set, but you can still start to introduce the reasons. And the key to using connective communication is obviously communicating in the way that they can understand. So the depth of information that you give will vary based upon child to child and their understanding of things and their age. The important thing too is that with very young children, toddlers um, and crawlers, we don't want to give, give them great detail of information that will put them in, into their minds and take them out of the present moment because then that can set them off on a whole different tangent and make them forget about the limit you're setting to begin with. So just remember to, when you're using uh, connective communication and giving them information, it always has to be age appropriate. And remember, you might need to repeat and repeat and repeat the limit that you're setting, okay? And as long as you can remain patient and loving and kind, and by using the connective communication, it will eventually settle in. But we cannot expect our children to remember the limit we set just when it's one time. Okay, we have to be patient and be willing to repeat and repeat and repeat. Rule number two, never, ever, ever let your child trample over your limits. Okay, this is a very key, key point here. If you're inconsistent in your limits, then your child will be inconsistent in their respect for you. If you don't respect the limit that you set yourself, you can't expect your child to respect it as well. So you need to respect the limit and never let your child trample your limits. And remember, like I said before, it's in their very nature as a healthy child to test the limits you set. So expect it. Expect it. You know, there's just... And parenting is not easy, and we have to accept that. And we have to accept our children are going to test our limits. They're going to push our buttons as well, right? And just like life's responsibilities will continue to, to come at us, we have to accept these things and expect them. And it's in their nature to do so. So we just have to remember to hold our ground. Never, ever let them trample even the smallest limit without intervening. If you ignore the small stuff, then you're giving them permission to ignore the big stuff. In other words, if you say to your child, I don't want you eating this candy, um, but they sneak off and eat that candy and you have a million other things you have to clean up and the phone is ringing and you have to take care of another child, help them with the homework, and the, the dog starts to 
has to be let out, and and you know you got and, and life just starts to bombard you with things at the same time. You know, if you ignore the small limits and you don't intervene there, then you're giving them permission to ignore the bigger limits. So as much as you're able to intervene, you have to step in even with the smallest limits because then you're setting the example. You're saying, no, when I say something, I mean it and there's no give there. You have to be firm in your limits, the small ones and the big ones. That's a very crucial point. Of course, you know, you have to be reasonable and sometimes you just don't, you know, it's just not the time to do so and you might have to just ignore something because you have no choice. But if you can, okay, if you can step in and intervene and you can tell your other child to, to, to uh, work on their homework for some time and you can ignore the phone call and you can put the dishes aside and just so that you can step in and um, reaffirm that limit that your child is trying to break, then that will go a long way to making it easier to set limits later on. So, and remember, don't forget rule number one, okay? Rule number one about connective communication. So whenever you're setting a limit and your child is trying to trample over it and you need to intervene to reaffirm that limit, maintain the connective communication, the way, the tone of your voice, the words that you use, so it doesn't break the connection, so you don't come across as being harsh, because the moment you come across as harsh, it, the child will feel disconnected more. And we'll talk greater about their need for connection, and why that's so important to get them to cooperate with you. Okay, so let's continue on with rule number three. Rule number three is whoever has the strongest willpower wins. Okay, so there's a hidden power struggle between all parents and children, and it has to do with who has the strongest will, who is the most persistent, who's the most tenacious, and who's got the most patience. Remember, it has to be you. You have to be the one with the strongest will, the, the most persistence, and the most tenacious, and the most patient. If it's not, then your child will manipulate you. They'll gain control over you, and then your limits will have, be much less effective because they won't respect you. They won't respect your limits. So you have to win this power struggle, okay? And it's not about taking away autonomy from your child. It's not about, uh, you know, being domineering or authoritarian. It, actually, it's the opposite of that. You allow them the opportunity to be autonomous, and you share the power with them when the circumstances allow it. But when it comes to setting limits, you have to be the most persistent, the most patient, the most tenacious to reaffirm that limit no matter what. Stop the traffic if you have to. Okay? If your child is stepping over the limit that you're trying to set, uh, you know, if you tell them not to climb on something and they're climbing on it and you let them do that, then you're telling them that your limits aren't worth respecting. Right? If, um, if, if you tell them not to do something and they do it and then you step in and they crack a joke and you laugh with them and then you, 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 uh, for, you don't reaffirm the seriousness uh, of the importance for them to follow the limit, then you've just trampled over your, your own limit, right? And you're letting them win by being a bit more manipulative in how they respond to you. I'm not saying that you, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to be harsh. And actually, if you're harsh, it's, it's, not, it's not effective to set these limits. You just have to be persistent. You have to be patient. And when you use the connected communication and you come at it from love and connection, then you'll be able to reaffirm these limits without hurting your child's feelings. And your child will greatly respect that. Okay? So you have to do whatever it takes. For example, if you're driving in the car and the children start to argue and, they don't, and you ask them to do something, you set a limit there, and they don't respect that limit, stop the car, pull over. If the ch children are playing with each other and one of them steps over the limit, interrupt the play. You know, it, you have to stop whatever's going on. Stop their world if you need to, right, in order to reaffirm that limit. It's not about being mean or harsh. Actually, it's the opposite. You stop their world with love and connection and you look into their eyes, and that's all about connected communication. You reaffirm the limit, and you let them know that there's no negotiating. There's no room there for them to, to, uh, to not respect your limit. You, know, you basically stop everything until you get them back on track. 
and don't be intimidated by tantrums. That's a big, um, a big, uh, basically way that children can uh, can manipulate their parents is by threatening tantrums, by starting to whine, by starting to get upset, and then a lot of parents give into that because they don't want to have to deal with that. If your child does throw tantrums, if that that's an issue for you then I recommend that you read my book on setting limits. I have a, a portion there about limiting temper tantrums. Or you can get the, the webinar on how to deal with tantrums uh, at the Parent Learning Club website. So if you go to parentlearningclub.com and under webinars, you can get the recording of a webinar that I did specifically on tantrums because it's a bit of a bigger subject there and how to, how to face these. But there's a way to set limits and help children through temper tantrums. I call it setting loving limits or healing limits because oftentimes if a child is just on the verge of having temper tantrums um, then oftentimes there's a deeper issue going on for them and you need to reaffirm that limit more than ever before because that if you don't um, then they'll always be at the edge of having this temper tantrum and there's a lot of feelings underneath that that need to be let out and they can use that against you uh, to manipulate you into to not follow your limits so don't be intimidated by tantrums set the limit, allow them to have a huge temper tantrum and flip out, but maintain that connection while they're doing that. And that, and that way, temper tantrums can be a healing experience. It can be a way for them to just get out their frustration, get out their angst, get out their emotions, um, get out whatever is bothering them that's underneath that. Because oftentimes, if a child is having a temper tantrum about one thing, really, the, the feelings that are underneath, that are motivating, that are fueling the temper, tantrum, temper tantrums, have to do with something else. So if you allow them to have that temper tantrum, you set the limit and you say, no, I'm sorry, uh, I, no matter how much you're going to yell and scream and, and flail, I'm not going to, to let you have this candy because you've had enough sugar and we're going to have dinner soon and it's just not the time for you to have a sweet, sweetie, I'm sorry. And if they have a huge flip out, let them have that flip out because you need to have the strongest willpower here. You need to be more patient, more persistent. So patient that you're willing and able to weather the storm of the strongest temper tantrum. May, of course, you make sure that they don't hurt themselves or anybody else while they have a tan temper tantrum, but you need to, to stand firm there. Okay? And be prepared again to wait and wait and wait, right, for them to get back on track. So there's one story, uh, this just happened recently where I had a number of kids over and they were bouncing on a trampoline. And then, you know, one of the rules with the, with the trampoline is that there's no pushing on the trampoline. And so I saw that they started, and some of the boys were starting to push each other. So I told them, I set a limit with my voice, I reminded them, okay, and this goes on to the next step here, uh, be prepared to repeat and repeat and repeat. So I repeated to them, remember, no pushing on the trampoline, and I told them that if they keep pushing, then they can't jump on the trampoline. Right? That's just a rule. There's a limit. It's, that's just how it is. Um, and then they kept doing it right away. So the, I knew they're old enough to hear me. They're old enough that I don't have to repeat it ten times or even three times uh, for them to, to know this because they've been over before and they know this rule. But at this point in time, for some reason or other, they just weren't respecting uh, the limit that I was setting. Perhaps because something was going on with them and their other parents that they just weren't respecting their limits and so they're just caught up in a pattern of not listening to adults and doing whatever they wanted. I'm not sure exactly but that didn't concern me. What concerned me is getting their respect and reaffirming that limit. So I intervened and I went over the trampoline. I stopped what I was doing and I stopped their traffic and I said, sorry guys, you're going to have to get out. I told you there's no pushing and um, if you don't follow that then we can't bounce now. So uh, some of them got out, but a couple stayed in. They tried to just ignore me and tried to keep bouncing, and I just kept telling them. I did. I I became so annoying that they couldn't enjoy themselves. There was two of them, and then the the the, the one of them got out, and then there was just one of them, and he tried to ignore me. But I was so annoying by being persistent, by being tenacious, and I didn't get upset. You know, I didn't get angry. I didn't get harsh. I didn't threaten them, um, and I wasn't punishing them. They knew that this is the rule, and I told them it's because I don't want you to get hurt, right? I'm being rational, I'm being logical. They couldn't argue it, and they, they, they promised that they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it again, but, uh, but at, the, at that point, I'd already asked them to, and I could see that they weren't listening, they weren't paying attention, so I said, 
you can you can go on in about 15 minutes but I need you all to get out right now because that's the rule I don't want anyone to get hurt and I just stay there and eventually the one child who who initially was ignoring me he couldn't ignore me any longer and none of the children were having fun because the I was being so annoying and present there that I was interrupting any play that they could have so eventually he had to get out and I wasn't harsh I wasn't uh, mean I didn't threaten them I didn't promise them anything I just reaffirmed uh, the limit by having the strongest willpower and if you would have continued uh, to, to not bounce perhaps I might have even gotten in there and been so annoying inside the trampoline and just directed him to to getting out of the trampoline I wouldn't have pushed him or anything like that but I would have just showed shown him the best course of action and that's what we want to do as democratic parents we want to guide our children we want to inspire them and encourage them and show them the best course of action without needing to threaten them or to to uh, motivate them through fears or through greed like through using bribes and we'll get into that in greater detail okay so I see some questions coming in here and I'll get to them as soon as I finish the main information part of this webinar but I just want to go through these main details first so don't forget rule number one right being uh, using connected communication so those are the three rules to setting limits that children will respect use connected communication children are more receptive to that they listen much better when you use that type of communication to never let your child trample over your limits reaffirm those limits no matter what and whoever has the greatest will wins be more persistent and more patient and more tenacious than your children okay and then they will respect you more and they'll know that your no means no and they'll know that you'll outweigh them right you, you so that they can't continue to be annoying they can't keep begging and asking you in a whole bunch of different ways because you've trained them you've reaffirmed to them again and again um, when um, uh, that, that you just won't give in to their demands when you set a firm limit then you set a firm limit and that's the end of the story now why don't we use punishments or threats to get them obey well it's because both use fear they both of them use fear or emotional or physical pain as motivating forces the thing is is that fear is the anticipation of pain and fear triggers what's called the amygdala part of the brain which actually reduces clear thinking memory recall and good judgment we call this amygdala hijacking and this is something really important to understand um, about about people and about children about how stress and fear can make them think less clearly and why punishments and um, and threats and using this type of manipulation and discipline is really ineffective and why and that's how democratic discipline and using um, uh, natural consequences and setting limits and this other type of discipline is much more effective you see the amygdala part of the brain is the survival instinct this has to do with um, with our, our basically surviving threats and uh, emotional response it has to do with stress the frontal cortex which is the front part of the brain has to do with memory recall clear thinking good judgment rational thinking so when we're setting limits when we're talking about rules we want children to remember them we want them to understand them so that they can think more clear and they can have better overall judgment and so if we can keep them in the frontal cortex part of the brain which comes from when they feel that life is good when they feel that their needs are met when they're not stressed when they feel um, that, that they have a good zest and they feel connected then they stay in their frontal cortex part of their brain when they begin to get stressed when they get emotional if their needs get unmet then they start to be um, driven by their unmet needs they, then they go into the amygdala part of the brain so the amygdala part triggered by our survival instinct this is important to understand when we talk about the number one need for children which is their need for connection okay it's important to understand that children inherently and instinctively need to feel connected with their adult caregivers this is a survival instinct in children because they instinctively know that their very survival meaning their their food and their lodging um, is is dependent on their connection with their with their adult caregivers with their parents 
So anything that threatens their sense of connection instinctively triggers this fear response, this stress response, triggers them, uh, triggers the amygdala, right? So even if they just feel slightly disconnected from you, if you yell at them or if you give them a timeout, that will trigger their, um, their instinctive response, uh, the amygdala part of their brain, and they'll, be, they'll think less clearly, okay? They'll be more emotional. They'll get stressed. They'll feel emotionally hurt, and they won't be able to think as clearly. Sure, you know, if you put a child in a timeout, uh, after a while they might cool down and the, uh, the amygdala um, the hijacking reduces, and they might be, come back to their frontal cortex. But a lot of the timeouts and, uh, and these types of punishments, what they do more than anything is they increase the disconnection. They increase the space between the child's um, uh, uh, feeling uh, well taken care of. So it decreases their, their needs and it increases their stress and it has the long-term opposite effect. And why don't we use bribes and rewards to get them to obey? Well, one problem is an escalation. So if you start to use bribes, you bribe your child to do something, at first you might just have to bribe them with a, a treat or sugar, uh, but then the, the, uh, the bribes, the need for the bribes will escalate. Soon that won't be enough and they'll want a little bit more. And then eventually the child's going to be motivated by greed. And it's a way to, to quickly corrupt the child's innate goodness. Okay, we want children to have really strong values and to stand behind them and not to be corrupted by, um, by greed. But if you start to bribe them for their behavior, for doing things, you teach them that it's okay to accept bribes, to be corrupted um, because they want things. And the other problem um, is that these bribes and rewards for good behavior disconnect children from their hearts and their natural motivations. You see, children naturally want to feel connected. They, they're naturally generous. They naturally want to have your approval and to, and to work all together. They're social creatures, right? And they want to give. They're extremely loving. But if we start to reward them for good behavior, then it disconnects them from that natural instinct and that desire to be generous and good and sweet. Okay, so there's a, there's a fine line between giving rewards for good behavior and giving rewards for other things. You know, I, I think it's fine if you want to give rewards as a fun way um, to, um, to, uh, to reward them for accomplishing a certain thing. That can be a great way to mark the accomplishment. But if you reward them for good behavior, then there's two negative parts to that. One, is that it triggers a little bit of fear as well because they're going to fear not getting the reward. Not getting the reward is equal to punishment. Okay, so they're going to have be slightly stressed about that as well. And then the other thing too is that children should behave well because that's just the way that we should all behave well, right? We shouldn't be rewarded for our behavior, right? Positive uh, reinforcement in terms of uh, how people respond to our behavior should be reward enough. Right? So just being generous is a natural instinct. It should be rewarded for being nice uh, with others. So that's, that's my, my belief, and that's the approach with democratic parenting, is that giving bribes a reward for good behavior will actually just take them away from, uh, from their natural instinct. Now, if children's needs are met, right, and they, they are stress-free, they'll naturally behave well. They'll naturally feel connected. But if their need for encouragement is not met, if their need for contribution, participation, inclusion, and connection is unmet, if their need for attention is unmet, then that's when they start to, to act out. It's important to understand the underlying reasons for difficult and challenging behavior. And I talk about that a lot in my other work, uh, you know, in the seven alternatives to punishment um, uh, e-course. If you haven't signed up for that, you can send a, an email and you can get that. Um, or in my book, that's what I talk about, the very foundation of democratic parenting is in understanding the underlying root causes for difficult and challenging behavior. So we need to address those underlying root causes which have to do with their deeper uh, uh, legitimate childhood needs. And if we meet those needs and if we can deal with uh, stress or uh, emotions as they come up, then we don't have to bribe or reward their good behavior because they'll behave good and connective, in connective ways naturally by themselves. Punishments, threats, bribes, and rewards for good behavior can get kids to obey in the short term, but in the long term, they cause damage. 
through stress and anxiety, right? Stress and anxiety where they're going to fear the punishments, uh, feel anxious about a threat, or they might fear and be anxious that they're not going to get a reward. And oftentimes a child's a sense of self-esteem and worth can come through the rewards that they get, right? They can start to base their entire uh, esteem and identity upon whether or not they get rewards. And if they don't get rewarded, that can really hurt their esteem. And, um, and their unmet needs, okay? Again, their needs for connection and participation and information and autonomy. If these are unmet, if these things are missing, but you're just, you know, you're, you're punishing them and motivating them and manipulating them through bribes and rewards um, to cover up the lack of unmet needs underneath, then the, the suffering and the difficulty of this perpetuating unmet needs is going to, is going to cause a further damage. Okay, it's, gonna, it's kind of like um, feeding, feeding uh, obese children, um, you know, really unhealthy food that, is, that doesn't have, it, don't have any nutrients in it. Um, you know, like I say, like a lot of ice cream and just nutrient uh, void food. So the, the obese child may be eating a lot, right? They might be eating a lot, but cellularly, they're not getting the nutri nutrients and nutrition that they need. So on a cellular level, they are starving. And this is a big problem with, uh, with obesity today and a lot of the nutrition in our mainstream diet the, the food that's marketed towards children and, and the general population, the really cheap food, is lacking in nutrients um, a lot. So people might be eating a lot, but really they're starving on a cellular level. And it's the same thing here where we might be motivating and manipulating our children to behave better through threats and bribes and rewards and punishments, but their deeper needs are, are, are still starving. Okay, and then modeling aggressive and manipulative behaviors, right? If we use threats and punishments to coerce our children, then we're teaching them that they can get what they want and they can manipulate others through threatening uh, them or punishing them, uh, you know, uh, in different ways. Or we're teaching them to manipulate other people by bribing them, by convincing them, coercing them, rather than using a connective style of communication that wins their cooperation, right? If they can just use their words and the, this, uh, this amazing ability and skill that we're all inherently given, this ability to communicate, then they can communicate their desire to connect with and to cooperate with other children using their words, and they can inspire people through their words, right? What's better, getting someone to cooperate through inspiring them with their words or getting them to cooperate through manipulating them? Or, or, um, or bullying them, right? So that's the difference here. That's why we want to avoid using these and use these democratic parenting methods. So with this democratic parenting formula, you'll never need to use bribes or punishments again. And the formula is simple. Connective communication plus setting kind and firm limits. And that's what equals an obedient and a happy child. So let's just go a little bit deeper and talk about a few points about connective communication. So it's not what we say, it's how we say it, right? And it's all about body language, tone of voice, and using eye contact. You want to practice poise and patience and stay in control, right? So the key is you stay in emotional control so you don't get upset, right? Just be, be patient. And children will test our patience. You know, and the great thing that when we practice patience, our reward is that we have more patience, right? And we avoid hurting our child. The other reward is we'll get a lot more, a more cooperative child. And they'll become much more easy over time because they, they see that you have the strong willpower and they gain incredible respect for you the more patient and the more, uh, more that you can be in a state of poise when communicating with them. Remember, meet them where they are at. If they're returned from school or daycare uh, and they're upset and they're, feel, they're disconnected, meet them there, right? Don't try to pull them into your world. If you're in a good mood and connected place, you know, you, then use that energy, use that motivation that you have to meet them where, where they're at and then bring them to where you, you are, right? Don't try to force them where you are because you'll find a very resistant child. Meet the child where they're at, both emotionally and physically, if you need to set a limit or to connect with them, sometimes you just have to kneel down, look them in the eye, face to face to meet them where they're at. Uh, and stay open, right? Feel their heart. 
no matter what, no matter how difficult, no matter how trying, no matter how oppositional defiant they are, stay open and feel their heart. Now, if they start cursing at you or insulting you or these types of things, you, you may have to reaffirm a verbal limit there by saying, sweetheart, we don't talk to each other like that, or darling, I'm not going to let you call me those names. I, I know that's not how you truly feel. I understand that you're you're upset or frustrated, and I love you, but we're going to speak sweetly and kindly to each other. You see, that's a verbal limit. That's setting a positive verbal, verbal limit, and you're setting the example for them to follow, because children are natural born mimics. They follow our example. So if you set the example in setting verbal limits, right, then they, they greatly respect that because you're not hurting their feelings. So then they want to maintain that. The last thing a child wants is to be hurt by your words or by your tone of voice because they're incredibly sensitive to that. So if they continue to verbally abuse you, you reaffirm that limit. You just reaffirm that. Remember, you have to have the, the, the stronger will, right? You can't let them trample over the limit, but, but they might test that. They might continue to test that. So the key here is in the skill I call reaching through disconnect, okay? By reaching through disconnect, the only reason that they might be verbally abusive or say negative things is because they're disconnected from you. Remember, when they're in a state of connection, when they're stress-free, their needs are met, they're going to be naturally loving, naturally generous. They're going to want to maintain your approval. They're going to want to have that connection with you. It's only when they get disconnected, when they feel upset or emotional or stressed, where they're going to resort to any type of uh, difficult or challenging or sometimes outright mean behavior. But if you maintain this limit, this verbal limit, giving them the example, using connected communication like the terms of endearment, like darling or sweetheart, or my sweets, you know, whatever sweet words you can use, that helps for them to soften that, that upsetness. It helps them to relax more. And the more that you maintain your poise and your patience, the more you show them that it's safe for them to just emotionally let go. It's safe for them to drop the, um, the anger or the hurt because you're, you're providing them with what I call an emotional safety cocoon. You're not going to get upset because you don't want them to feel, okay, the moment they start to open up and the moment they start to relax, then you start to lose your patient, then they're going to feel hurt and then, you know, psychologically and subconsciously they're going to realize, okay, they're going to feel it's not safe to open up. It's not safe to be vulnerable with my mommy or my daddy. I need to I need to stay disconnected in order to protect myself because their tone of voice really hurt my feeling, right? You don't, so you want to avoid that. And a lot of this, remember, happens on a subconscious level. That's why you use connected communication to communicate to them on a subconscious and a conscious level that, that you're there with them, you're meeting them where they're at, you love them, and that you want to open up. And you're going to be patient. You're going to wait for them and show them the example of, of using a loving and connective way of relating. Remember to be aware of their deeper needs, okay? So uh, I talk about this in my book and on the, um, in the seven alternatives to punishment and in the, I have a whole webinar on the 15 essential childhood needs. 15 essential needs that all children must have met in order for them to be uh, stress-free and cooperative and easy to deal with. If any one of these needs is unmet, then they'll start to act out. And these are instinctual needs. Uh, it's it, it's like if we need to go to the bathroom, if we're in the car and we really need to go pee and we're driving, you know, as our bladder fills, soon we become more and more disconnected from those around us and our ability to think uh, rationally and clearly will diminish at the same level as our need to go to the bathroom increases, right? And soon that's the only thing that we can possibly think about. That's a physical need, right? We also have emotional needs and psychological needs, which are just as strong. And they, and they control us, and they rule our behavior um, more than we often think. Our need for autonomy, our need for attention, our need for affection, our need for connection, our need for encouragement. These are instinctual human needs, and children must have these met in order for them to behave easily and more openly. So encourage them towards better solutions and directions. So oftentimes if a child is uh, crossing a limit or they're acting out, 
Um, they're doing so because they're exploring and they're learning about their world, about different things. And sometimes they're exploring and learning about things or being creative in ways that is not really convenient for their situation, like a child who's drawing on their wall or something like this, right? They're doing, they're just expressing their, their art, their creativity. But you don't really want to be cleaning up the wall, and so you want to provide a limit and then give them a piece of paper so they can draw, they can draw on. So rather than getting upset at them, um, you know, just encourage them towards a better solution and a better direction. This is really about redirecting our children to get them back on track. And this can do with all different types of, of, uh, of situations and limits. That if a child crosses the limit, we have to look at their deeper needs. Maybe they just have a need for a creative exp expression. They just want to play or have fun or to explore something. So we can meet that, that, that need, and, but provide them a better way to do that. So that's the skill of redirecting our children. Be inclusive and connective. Use these types of words like we and us and let's. And that builds a sense of connection and inclusiveness and helps need, meet their needs for connection and their need for contribution and participation so that they can feel that they're a part of the family. So they're not separate from the family and they don't feel like you're zeroing them out from everyone else and everything else. Instead, you're including them and bringing them into the, the best uh, type of behavior and the best way to relate to the situations. Okay. So that was just an overview of connective communication. Uh, there's an entire chapter in my book, Democratic Parenting, that goes into greater detail about connective communication. There's also a webinar that I did called um, uh, the, um, the Disobedient, uh, no, sorry, that's this webinar, <laughs> the, the, uh, the um, Dealing with a Defiant Child. Okay, so there's a connective communication webinar about dealing with defiant children uh, at the Parent Learning Club website, and you can go in there. Also, if you have taken my ADHD program, uh, there's a whole part in that program, too, about uh, the connective communication skills. So if you want more skills on uh, connective communication, you can look at any of those resources. Now, what's the secret to building respect with children? The real secret, okay? So the secret is in understanding what the word respect means. If you look at the root meaning of the word respect. Spect comes from um, spect, uh, spectacle, spectare is a Latin word. It means to look, to see, to look at. So respect means to look again, to examine uh, anew with new eyes. So it really has to do with seeing our ch child for who they are, seeing the mirror in our child. Remember, children are natural born mimics and models. And that's how, and most of us are, you know, that's how we learn how to, uh, we learn new roles at work. We learn how, as children, we learn how to walk and talk and relate to the world through the role models around us. So the secret to building respect with children, it's like mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most of them all? And that blank there is up to you. What skills do you want to teach your child? You know, whatever skills, whatever principles, whatever values you want to pass on to your child, if you live those values, if you mirror those values for your child, they will take those on. If you want your child to be respectful, then be the most respectful yourself. If you're, you want your child to be conscientious and um, generous, then be the most generous yourself. If you want your child to be congruent and um, and cooperative, then be congruent and cooperative yourself. They will model your behavior. So the more respect you show your child by respecting their deeper needs, by respecting where they are at and meeting them there. When you meet a child where they're at and you use connective communication, they're going to respect you. Just look at an experience that you might have had with, with a, a boss in your life or a manager, right? If you're boss and manager was respectful to you, if they treated you with, uh, with empathy and they connected with you and they listened to you and they gave you attention, they were interested in you, then didn't you respect them so much more, right? If they used the type of communication that made you feel connected to them, that made you feel like they cared, right, that made you feel like they respected you and that they weren't talking down to you, then you respect them back. But look at situations, whether it's a boss or manager or maybe a family member who might have, uh, 
who, who speaks in maybe a condescending tone who, or who you felt not respected by um, or maybe you know they, they wouldn't even look you in the eye at certain times you know how much respect did you have for them how much willingness did you feel that you wanted to make an effort to cooperate with them well not very much right if a boss isn't kind to you um, you know and respectful and communicate to you in, in in positive and reinforcing, reinforcing and encouraging ways, then you weren't very inspired to do your work, right? You were much less motivated. It's the same with children, right? Our children will be much less motivated to uh, to follow through on the things you want them to do if you're not respectful and encouraging and communicating with them in uh, using this connected communication. So finally, the last part here that I want to discuss before we go into the question and answer period are the biggest mistakes that parents make when setting limits. The first one is that they're too harsh, right? They set the limits, they use too much no, their tone of voice is too harsh, they're basically too authoritarian. And then the other one is having inconsistent limits, right? And so I see this a lot with parents who might tend to be a bit more permissive in their parenting. They're inconsistent. One day they're going to set the limits um, and then the next day they'll let their child trample right over the limit, right? One day they, they tell the child not to bounce on the couch. The next day they're throwing the child on the, on the couch them, themselves, okay? Uh, one day they're, uh, they're, they're letting their child jump on them. The next day they get upset when their child is, is jumping on them. So they're being inconsistent in their limits and behaviors and this really makes children, uh, really upsets children, this lack of consistency because it's one of the, the need for consistency and predictability is one of the 15 essential childhood needs. If they don't live in a consistent and predictable environment, their need for security goes down and this low level uh, of stress will start to build because they don't know what's going to happen next and they, they have a lot less trust and faith in their environment. So it's important to be consistent in our limits. And this, another one, is letting the child manipulate them with sweetness or humor or temper tantrums. Sometimes a child will, will be sweet and make promises and will beg uh, and make, you know, give the puppy eyes to try and get what they want and the, and the parent will give in to that, right? Another time uh, the child might say, might say or do something funny that makes the parent laugh and the parent just forgets about the limit and then just lets it slide. Or they might threaten them with temper tantrums uh, or start to get increasingly upset and the, and the parent starts to fear this temper tantrum. So the, the parent lets the child manipulate them through this way. And remember, this breaks the second rule of never letting a child trample over your limits. And then the other mistake is to be dogmatic. Okay, right. Every rule, you know, there is, it's not 100%. And there's always, um, there's always exceptions to every rule. Okay. Sometimes it's good to reassess the value of a limit if the circumstance allows it. Right. So I know I just said with rule number two, you never let a child trample over your limit. Well, yes, but there's always exceptions to the rule. Sometimes it might be a good thing to reassess the limit to gain the child's respect. If the child comes back to you to you to you with when you set a limit. Um, with a good reason, with good logic that shows that they're thinking clearly and they have good judgment and they understand the circumstances of the limit, but they give you a reason why they, you can make an exception there, well, it might be a very good reason to reassess it at that point and to not be dogmatic because if you're just dogmatic um, without taking in uh, new information or a new perspective that makes sense, then you're just being authoritarian and your child will not respect that because they'll sense that and that will build resentment. Right? You're just trying to hold control and power for the sake of power and control. Right? For the great example here is when my, when my child was much younger, we got a new couch that was white and uh, he wanted to bounce on the couch. And at this age, he was small, so I let him bounce on the couch for, you know, because it was, it was fine with me. It was a way to, to get exercise and to play. Now, um, but I didn't want him to get his dirty feet on the white couch. So I told him, I'm sorry, sweetie, I don't want you to bounce on the couch um, because it's a new couch and um, it's going to um, it's going to dirty the couch. So he said, well, what if I wash my feet and then bounce on the couch? I said, well, that's a good idea, sweetheart. You see, by acknowledging that, I'm encouraging his good thinking and that, that meets his need for, for autonomy and for encouragement. 
and also encourages them to think uh, creatively, to creatively solve problems. But I said to him, well, the only problem, though, is that when you walk from the bathtub to the couch, your feet might get a little bit dirty picking up some dirt off the floor because I haven't washed the floor in a couple of days. So then he said, well, what if I wash my feet and then put on socks and then walk across the floor and then take off my socks when I get to the couch and then bounce on it? Okay, I had to admit he got me there. That made a lot of sense. I could see at that point the couch wouldn't get dirty. And my issue, the reason why uh, I set the limit was because I didn't want to get the couch dirty. So I told him, okay, if you do that, and then when you get on the couch, before you bounce on it, you double check to make sure your feet are clean, then that's fine. But if you jump off the couch, then your feet might get dirty again. I don't want you to jump back on. Okay, so at that point, I reassessed the limit. And I, I, that gained respect. And I encouraged my child, again, to think creatively to solve problems and to come to new solutions uh, himself because here's the here's the fact is that all great inventions in the world um, have happened by people testing the limits by pushing the boundaries of what we know as reality that's how things get inv in, uh, invented that's the the source of innovation so we don't want to impede that in our children when we're setting limits we want to encourage that and there might be times when when we can allow the child to do that, right, and to encourage them to do that within the confines of reasonable limits. And the other biggest mistake is being impatient, right? So, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes as parents, we just have so much going on. We're exhausted. We're overwhelmed with the demands of parenting and providing for our children. We might just be stressed ourselves, and it's hard to be patient with children who are testing our limits or who are stressed and, you know, and we have a million other things to take care of at the same time. So it's important to feed yourself, to give to yourself, to feed your own emotional fuel tank. Build your own patience. Take some time for yourself. Rejuvenate yourself. Meet some friends for coffee. Get a massage. You know, get, get away in nature. Schedule some time in your week or your month to take a, a retreat by yourself or to, to do whatever it takes to fill your own emotional fuel tank. Maybe it's just inspiration by watching one of these webinars, getting inspired, reading a parenting book, uh, get, you know, getting some uh, mentoring or a parenting coach to give you new ideas, to re-inspire you, to give you new perspective on things. Um, you know, these, these can all go a long way to build up your patience so you're less reactive, okay? Because when we're impatient and reactive, it's hard to respond in intelligent ways because we're, we're, we, get, um, we get triggered ourselves. Okay, so that brings me to a special offer I'd like to offer all the webinar ticket holders here. I want to make everybody on this webinar an offer for a 20-minute free coaching call, okay, with myself to discuss your own unique situation with your child and to help you to figure out what some solutions might be for you to deal with any, any type of difficult behavior which might go beyond the, um, the, uh, the scope of this webinar. So if you want to claim this free coaching call with me, uh, then just email us at support at parentlearningclub.com and you get details on how to sign up for this 20-minute free coaching call. Okay, I hope you guys take me up on this offer and that I can support you in your parenting journey. Now, here's a time where you can ask your questions. There's a chat box in the webinar application. Just type in your question right there and I will do my best to answer them. Okay, so we have a question here. I don't want to celebrate Halloween and my kids don't understand why when it's fun for kids. I explained the history and did not celebrate it growing up, but what if they see my rationale as not making sense and that it's in the past? How to reinforce when it's counter culture? Okay, that's a great question, right? Because uh, some of us might be in cultures where, um, where we're, we're having to deal with a, a culture clash or, or different opinions and different ideas. Um, so at that point, you can, uh, you can simply just, uh, just keep explaining to them and deal with their, their emotions. And you know, at that, you know, what you might do at that point is to, is to make up your own unique uh, family celebration for, to celebrate something different. Uh, Because you know, the child at that point might feel deprived and that might be some resentment or, uh, or, you know, that builds up in the child that they might have a hard time getting over. But if you can let them see the positive in that, right, by maybe making some type of other 
celebration or situation, you know, maybe you can make a nice dinner that night or you can uh, you make your own unique family outing. Um, you know, that's, that's a way that you can inspire them to be happy and, and uh, about what's happening within your, your own culture. You know, uh, like maybe when you grew up, you might have had a hard time also with that, uh, with not celebrating that, or maybe not. Maybe you just accepted it, and maybe uh, your children are quite different from you. And it's you know, it's not easy to uh, to reinforce values and ideas um, within when the when the cultural um, trends of our time might go opposite to that. So we need to be patient. We need to stand firm, and you know, do our best to explain them the details and why and the values, you know, and then our children will in time learn to respect that. And sometimes we just have to deal with their, their, um, their, their lack of happiness uh, with, with that, that fact and um, you know, deal with those emotions and help them through that. Okay, so yeah, uh, so you said also you see them trampling over the limit of not wanting to celebrate Halloween. Well, the only way that they could trample over that limit is if you give in to that and then you do start to celebrate them celebrate the, Hall the Halloween. Um, you know, if you stand firm in your limit, and even though they want to, um, you know, or maybe at some point they, you know, when they get older, they start to try to sneak out and celebrate that, then at that point you can, you can uh, deal with that limit in a different way when they're, when they're old enough to, you know, sneak out of the house. You might have to take stronger measures at that point to, to redirect them towards better behavior. But for now, um, they won't trample over it unless you let them by you yourself giving in and beginning to celebrate that Halloween or to give in to any of a uh, you know, culturally dominant uh, activity or, or, or celebration. Okay, um, okay, so Disha asks, uh, can you give an example of how you can set a loving and firm limit um, so it doesn't sound harsh? So I gave a few examples before about using connected communication by saying, sweetie, I'm afraid that I'm not going to let you, I'm a, uh, sweetie, I'm afraid that we're not going to be cel celebrating Halloween because I simply don't believe in it and, um, you know, and you can outline the reasons, give them a lot of information and logic because of that and then from there, uh, you know, just respond, just listen to them and respond to what they might have to say. So I gave a few different examples already because this uh, question was from earlier. Okay, a question from Zara. I have a 15-year-old boy who teases and bullying his younger brothers. How do I stop that? Okay, well, you need to follow what I just outlined. You need to set a firm limit there and just not let him tease or bully them. Every time that he teases and bullies them, you need to interrupt that. You need to intervene, and you need to use connective communication because if you use any type of harsh or punitive communication, you're going to be reaffirming that harsh uh, the communication that he might be using with his younger brothers. If you use loving and connective communication when you reaffirm that limit, you're going to show him that it's, it's quite possible and uh, it's quite effective to inspire someone's cooperation by using that type of loving communication. So. Uh, so just what you want to do is to just intervene as much as possible. And uh, another thing you might try to do is to use what I call uh, family meetings. So I have a chapter in my book, Democratic Parenting, about using family meetings. Also in the seven alternatives to punishment online e-course that, uh, that I offer as well, I talk about uh, family meetings as well and how to set these up. And this is very effective to do with older children and teenagers, so to bring up these types of issues. But there's a framework to follow with family meetings in order for them to be effective so the child doesn't feel, uh, so one of the child, for the, if you're 15 year old in this example, so he doesn't feel cornered or, um, or, uh, or resistant in this type of family meeting environment. So I recommend that you could also try that as well as making sure that you set that limit and stick with it and don't let him trample over it. Okay, there's another question here from Renell. I usually get involved when my 10 and 9 year old are arguing because it could end up in hitting. So I intervene and try to have them resolve, but some say I need to let it, let them fight it out. What do you think? Okay, um, well, that's, uh, you know, it's hard for me to answer that without dealing with the, uh, seeing the, the full situation. You know, every situation is unique. But if they, you know, if they're going to end up hurting each other, uh, verbally, um, 
or physically, I would say it's best to intervene. Give them the example of using connective communication to resolve their issues. Now, it, it does happen that all children and siblings can get engaged in some push and pull in how they communicate and how they learn how to share their space and get their needs met. So there's uh, that, that's just inevitable for a little bit of sibling uh, rivalry and some sibling um, arguing. So you just need to decide for yourself where that limit is, where it's okay and where they're going to cross that limit. And when they, if they start to get perhaps abusive or mean or insulting in their communication or if they hurt each other, then, yeah, I would definitely recommend setting that limit so that they can learn where that limit is and they can work within that, those boundaries to, make, to find solutions, right? So that, this is an amazing skill you'll teach them if you can use this, is to teach them, okay, it's fine for you to resolve your differences using this type of communication and these tools at your disposal, but to manipulate each other, uh, to hurt each other with your words or, with your, uh, or physically is completely unacceptable, and that's the limit, and you don't ever let them cross that. And they'll, they'll find a way to do that. Children and humans and all, all, all humans are incredibly adaptable and creative. Okay, Gabriella says, you say in your, uh, you say in your book that, that I should be flexible, for example, with the transition, but it seems like my daughter takes a mile when I give an inch. Oh, yes. Well, that's true, right? So that's the eternal uh, balance and the, you know, that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the conundrum of all parents, right? When do we be flexible and when do we be firm? And that's the balance we need to reach and no two situations are the same to when we should maintain that firmness and stand our ground or when we should be a little bit more flexible. So it's true, and children just naturally do that. Oftentimes they will take a mile when we give an inch. So if we intend to give an inch, then we stick to that inch. Right? If we tend to, to give an inch and they take a foot and we, we assess the situation and we say, okay, you know, I intended to give an inch, but maybe I was a little bit, wasn't really meeting my child where they are at. And they might have, they might, they might actually need a foot. And if I give a, a foot, that might help the situation resolve itself and we can just move on to something else. So I'll give a foot and we'll, um, and that's going to be fine. No one's going to get hurt. I'm not letting them trample over uh, any firm limits. Okay. I'm not, I'm not reinforcing, um, diff, um, Ne negative behavior around the way they respect my limits, then at that point you might give a foot. But if they take a mile and that's way too much, then you have to stop at the foot. Okay, so there's no, there's no right or wrong to any situation, right? Every, every, the world is, is filled with a lot more gray than black and white. And that's, like I said, the balance and the, the difficult call, judgment call that all of us have to make for ourselves and for our family and for our children in any given situation, when do we be flexible and when do we be firm? You know, if your child is caught up in a pattern of disrespect and limits all the time, then we need to be firm more than flexible, right? If we tend to be too authoritarian, uh, you know, and too punitive, and our child is being more withdrawn and more fearful and less creative in their problem solving, then maybe we need to be more flexible. Okay, authoritarian parents tend to need to be more, need more flexibility, and permissive parents need to be a bit more firm. So it's up to you, again, to decide where you're going to draw that line. And you might need to reassess, given the situation, to give a little bit more, but you have to maintain that objective perspective to make sure you don't give too much to a point that it depletes you or that it builds resentment in you, because that's the problem why a lot of parents end up losing their patience is that they build up this type of resentment with their child because they let their child trample over their limits, right? So they get resentful at themselves and at their child even when they don't mean to just because they haven't stuck with their limits enough or their child has some other issues that, uh, that they haven't been able to help them deal with. That's why I wanted to offer this free coaching call is that sometimes there's other things that are at play here that just make it really difficult to help the child get back on track with their behavior. And once we can isolate these to figure out what the root cause is, then everything becomes a lot easier. So that's what I do with, on these coaching calls and with the other coaches that I train. That's what we teach is to help uh, I, uh, identify the root cause for the behavior and how to come up with solutions 
to deal with the root causes as well as to maintain the limits uh, to deal with the behavior itself. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Next question from Visha. How do I get my three-year-old to stay in her bed at night without a gate, with locking the door or reward? Great question, Disha. Um, you might be interested in the webinar recording that I did on bedtime transitions because dealing with the uh, uh, nighttime transitions and bedtime is a bit of a bigger issue. There's uh, lots of things that are at play here. So I did a webinar on that that you can get at theparentlearningclub.com under webinars. Uh, look for the bedtime transitions where I talk specifically about how to deal with these uh, types of issues. But to answer your question in a bit of a general uh, way, the, the key with a three-year-old staying in bed um, is, to, is to reaffirm that limit. Be patient. Practice the protocol I showed here. And I wouldn't say uh, rewarding, right, because, um, because that's going to be counterproductive in the greater scheme of things. And I wouldn't say locking the door either. Instead, you might have to stand there, okay, and you might have to just reaffirm her. And again, it takes an incredible amount of patience and persistence and energy for you to do. Okay, but we're talking about using a different types of parenting that builds uh, long-term respect and uh, long-term cooperation, not short-term solutions. Uh, you know, these lock in the door uh, will might be a short-term solution, but it causes the child to feel a bit trapped, and it can build out a type of anxiety and stress for the child, which is going to lead to other problems that are going to start to surface. So it's not a long-term solution. It's the short-term solution. Giving them the rewards is, again, a short-term solution because you're going to find yourself needing to reward them to get them to do all kinds of things. But if you can follow the, the, um, the protocol that I outlined in this webinar, then you're going to set the stage where they're going to start to learn to respect you and your word, and soon you only have to say things once or sometimes twice. And because they're, they're stress-free and they're receptive and they're respectful, they listen to what you say. You know, you don't have to say it loud. They listen to the small things you say, and then they start to anticipate um, your needs. Right? My, my child now, you know, he's sometimes ready for bed before I have to tell him that he's, it's, it's bedtime. You know, he will, he will help me take in the groceries from the car without me even asking him, right? Because this is years of using these democratic parenting methods where now he feels completely connected. His needs are met. He knows the situational needs, and he knows where he can help. He knows that he's a part of the family, that he participates, and that as long as he participates, then his needs will be met. As long as he helps everyone else's needs get met and the needs of the, of the whole family unit in the home, then he gets those needs met himself. So it's a win-win-win situation. And that's what we want to inspire with our children, is that type of awareness of everybody's needs, the whole situation. And it starts young. Right? It's not easy, okay? You have to use a lot of patience to, to reaffirm those limits with your child, especially around nighttime. So uh, I would definitely recommend to get that webinar because it talks a lot greater in how to deal with this specific problem. But otherwise, you just you know, avoid locking the door and the reward and try to set and reaffirm those limits. Okay. Um, so we're now asked, what about situations where the child is in a difficult situation with their peers and they choose the high road by doing what, what's right, but they don't see it immediately? How is a parent... And I support and encourage them so that they know they did the right thing by doing the right thing. Just tell them. Just say, sweetie, I'm really proud of you. You did the right thing. I'm very proud of you. Give them a big hug and kiss. Hey, and that's worth gold, you know. How many times, you know, can you remember when your parent, your parent told you they were proud of you, gave you a hug? Maybe a lot of parents I've talked to today, their parents never told them that they were proud of them, never told them that they loved them. Right? And oftentimes, that's all we want as children. Even when we're adults, some adults are still trying to get their parents' approval by what they're doing, by the choices they're making. And to hear that their, their parent, even though they might be you know, seven years old, is proud of them, that's like gold. It's the same thing for children. Just tell them that's, that's, that's more than enough encouragement. Okay. So Gail asks, what can I do when your child refuses to stop what they are, okay, um, sorry, okay, sorry, that was just unclear, she, uh, you wrote again, Gail, they keep doing the behavior and refuse to stop until you become physical, no matter what we do, she repeats this every day, 
she stays with us. And when she's punished, she cries louder and louder and louder and refuses to do it, what we ask. Okay, so uh, what, what I would recommend for you, Gail, it's hard for me to know the exact situations. Uh, I would definitely recommend you take me up on this free coaching call so I can figure out perhaps if there's some underlying issues that are going on for your child because it's hard for me to tell just from this question um, some, some of the other details that might be at play here. But it sounds, you can see, right, that even when she's punished, she keeps crying and she still doesn't uh, do what you ask. So that's proof right there that punishments and threats just simply don't work. Uh, you would, I would also recommend you look through, watch this webinar again, take notes and see how you can apply it with your child. Uh, any of the webinars or the programs that we offer at Parent Learning Club can help you deal with your child's behavior by just meeting their needs and understanding what's going on and learning the type of this type of connective communication. You know, these are skills. This connective communication, setting these kind and firm limits, these are skills. And like any skill, you can't expect to be, do it perfectly the first time you try to apply it. When I first tried these, you know, it was uh, oftentimes it was a flop. But with practice, with persistence, you know, as I practice them more and more and more and understanding, you know, the root causes of my child's behavior, trying to figure out and asking myself, What's going on? Why is my child behaving like this? How could I respond this way? How could I respond this way? And I try one way, and sometimes it would work amazingly, and it would just shift the behavior for the problem never to surface again. Other times, something might come up, and I'll try one approach or one skill, and it's a complete flop. It doesn't work at all, so I have to just try something else. So we need to be patient with ourselves as we learn these skills. But take your time. Learn these skills. Read my book, Democratic Parenting. Listen to the webinars that, that I offer at the Parent Learning Club. Take our courses. All of these reinforce these different skills. And the more reinforcement and repetition and inspiration you get, the more easily it comes and the more you'll be able to apply it. So just practice the connective communication and setting these limits. And I would also recommend specifically for you, Gail, is to, uh, is to read uh, in my book, Democratic Parenting, Under Setting Limits, How to Set Limits with Temper Tantrums, and to look at that webinar on uh, dealing with temper tantrums, because it sounds like your child uh, is, is throwing these temper tantrums, and if you can learn how to work through them, how to help your child heal through temper tantrums, you'd be much more effective in getting through to her. Okay, so Renelle asks, what if you just don't want them to jump on the couch? Okay, so, and explain a couch is for sitting and not jumping, and they want to jump, and they can jump on the trampoline or outside. Jumping on the couch could be dangerous also. I know a kid who had concussions from jumping on a couch playing with balloons. Yes, definitely true, right? So this is for each person to, to decide what the limits are for appropriate behavior in their home. And for you, perhaps jumping on a couch is not something to be allowed. For others, it's fine. Uh, in my own situation, my, my son was very... Uh, a great balance, and um, you know, I encouraged him uh, to to uh, to to jump on the couch if he wanted to, and it was fine to up to a certain age. And so, it's up to each one of us to decide what's appropriate and what's not, given inside our home and inside the world. And we can teach and apply those to our child. And um, no two situations are the same, and you have to take care um, based upon the child's uh, uh, abilities and their age. Some children are more physically inclined towards others. Other children have more or less spatial awareness or more or less intellectual awareness to different things. Some children are more intellectually uh, advanced and so they'll understand things uh, in adult conversations which may be inappropriate for them to understand or get. So sometimes we have to limit what we communicate around our child just because of that child. Same thing with what we allow physically for them to do, some children might have less uh, a balance or spatial awareness and they can hurt themselves more easily. So we, you're right, we have to take care about that and apply the limits that we want to apply within our home. Erica, how should I manage needing uh, to frequently repeat limits in multiple areas? My daughter is 10 and I still have to remind her of simple house rules every day. Okay, so that's a great question, Erica, for a 10-year-old. Uh, at this point, they should be able to uh, know simple house rules, and you should not have to do them every day. At this point, what you might want to do is, like I said, 
um, you know, when you, uh, with uh, in rule number three, have the stronger will power, stop the traffic. Call a family meeting. Uh, you know, look at my book, Democratic Parenting, for the framework on how to set up an effective family meeting. And uh, it's not about lecturing a child. If you try to lecture a child, sit them down and just lecture them one-on-one, -on -one, it's usually ineffective. But by doing this family meeting protocol, it's extremely effective to help a child uh, re uh, learn and reinforce these limits themselves and to talk about them. You know, and um, also I talk about this too, again, in the seven alternatives to punishment about family meetings and how to set these up. So uh, review that information. That, that's a very good thing for an older child with, when you're talking about simple house rules or getting them to participate with chores or dealing with sibling rivalry uh, with older children is to just open up the conversation and with a family meeting there's a, a protocol and a framework there's a start and a middle and an end to family means for them to be effective and you need to know how to set them up how to start them otherwise if you set off on the wrong foot with a family meeting it's a complete flop but if you just follow the framework and protocol that I outline then it, they work great and when you get to the middle part the content that's when you can get your child, your daughter, to actually come up with solutions herself so she can remember these rules. You can ask her, you know, sweetheart, and you use this connected type of communication. You know, sweetheart, one of the things I wanted to talk about today in uh, our, this first family meeting, which is a lot of fun, and I'm really happy to, to have this, uh, this time to connect and to communicate about things in our home and our family, is uh, to talk about these, just these rules. And, you know, sweetheart, um, I sometimes I find myself just feeling a little bit frustrated and feeling like I'd much rather spend my time talking with you and connecting and playing with you or doing, you know, taking care of um, the dinner and other things rather than need to repeat these rules. And I'm sure that you found that sometimes I get a little bit frustrated myself and maybe I raise my voice or, you know, and I'm sure you'd want to avoid this too. So I wanted to ask you, darling, how how can we find a way for it so that I can avoid needing to repeat these rules every day. You know, is there something that you think that, that, I, that can help us achieve this goal? So you can see in the way I communicate that. This is really type of connected communication. I'm using a lot of terms of endearment. Um, I know I'm not pointing the finger at her. I'm not using what I call blame phrases by blaming her. I'm taking a lot of the responsibility for how I'm feeling and giving her a more um, uh, objective view of the situation, right? And of course, she's gonna, she's not, she, you know, no children like to have their parents upset or frustrated, and the tone, they can feel their tone of voice immediately. And children naturally will move away from uh, any upset tone of voice from their parents. That's why we want to avoid a harsh tone and use connective, loving tones because then they move towards that. So if if you know, so your daughter will know that you get frustrated by having to repeat that, and she'll want to come up with a solution. And when she comes up with a solution, right, it's, she's going to be much more effective in uh, in keeping that solution. But there might be other issues at play here as well, Erica. So uh, it might be a good thing for you to take me up on this free coaching call as well so I can help you determine perhaps what the deeper issue is. So um, so that, because there might be another reason why she's not recalling these rules. Perhaps there's some type of deeper emotional uh, uh, stress that's, uh, that's just an undercurrent there for her and sometimes stress can be very subtle and very minor but just enough to throw off the, the ability to, to be more aware and present in the moment um, and, and the child might be more distracted and uh, less you know able to retain these rules. So uh, try to ask yourself what might be the deeper needs here or what might be the underlying root cause and if you have my book Democratic Parenting it will take you through the three reasons for difficult behavior or in the seven alternatives, the punishment e-course, that goes through the, uh, the 15 needs and the, uh, the underlying reasons as well. Okay, um, so Catherine asks, please give an example of connective communication when you intervene with the older sibling bullying, or, or what words would you say, uh, what could you say calmly? Okay, so Catherine, at that point what you could do is you could say, uh, darling, uh, I'm not going to let you um, do that to your your brother or your sister. Um, we're, we're, we only relate to each other kindly, and I can see that uh, you know that you want to um, you want to play with that toy, or you want to 
uh, do something, you know, but this is how that you're going to, to uh, get what you want, okay? Um, that's just an example, it's just a general example. Without you giving me a specific situation of how the bullying happens, it's hard for me to intervene, but basically you want to use that connective communication and show them and communicate to them that, no, we, we don't, that's not allowed in our home and we're going to communicate kindly to each other. Okay, oftentimes a child is bullying another child because they have um, an unmet need at some point or they might and sometimes it's just they don't know how to communicate to the other child. They're lacking their need for information about how to communicate what they want or, or to get what they want or to relate to the other child is lacking. A great example of this is, um, you know, the, I was once in a van driving a van with my son and my niece and my nephews and uh, my nephew in the back started kicking the two kids up in the in the front seat and um, so the you know I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw what was going on I said okay this can get out of control really quick because the other kids were starting to elbow his foot and they're saying stop it stop it so what I did then is I said I need to set a limit and you know so I stopped the traffic I pulled over I pulled over put the van in park unbuckled my seatbelt and turned around and looked every one of them in the eye and they were just blinking staring right back at me completely quiet and not moving because they knew that something was up they knew that there was a limit that they all crossed and they none of them wanted to get punished but they didn't know what was going to happen next but then I said what's going on and I just let them talk right? I didn't blame anybody I didn't yell at them I didn't say stop it you guys you know, I just asked them a question, what is going on here? And so they said, well, he's kicking us. And then, you know, so I asked the child in the back, well, what are you doing? What's going on, sweetie? I didn't say, why are you kicking them? I asked them, what's going on, sweetie? And I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I know I'm reaching through to his heart, to the sweet child underneath who has needs for connection, for encouragement, who wants to participate. And I'm encouraging that aspect of the child by just the way I talk to them, by the way I ask questions. And so naturally, he's going to tend to want to maintain that uh, benefit of the doubt that I'm giving him. So he answered back, he said, well, I just want to put my foot up here on the armrest, and they're not letting me. So I said to him, well, how did you ask him? Did you ask them nicely and kindly in a sweet way if you could do that? And he said, uh, no. I said, well, why don't you try that right now to just ask them? And so he did. And so he said, well, hey, guys, do you guys mind if I just put my feet up here? And both of them were like, no, we don't mind at all, right? And then this, uh, it was solved right then and there. So I gave him information by uh, that because that's what he need. He just needed information. And the, the ch this child wasn't, you know, he taught how to use connective communication to get what he want. He had been conditioned just by, by default of using brute force and almost a type of bullying to get his way. And soon enough, the children just get engaged in a power struggle, and one feels wronged by the other, and then they end up hurting each other. And neither of them remember what happened to begin with, and they just blame each other. And we never get to understand the real underlying reasons that the argument began in the first place. So try to reach through with the older sibling and to get and ask them questions to understand why they're behaving that way. And then uh, use the connective communication to redirect them towards a more positive solution, towards a, a more positive direction uh, based upon what they need and why they're behaving that way. And at the same time, you, need, you probably need, will need to step in and to reaffirm the limit if they do begin any bullying. I hope that's helpful. Okay, is it possible for a couple to have different parenting styles and yet still implement democratic parenting? Definitely, now, And this is a question I get from a lot of parents. So there's a webinar specifically on this subject. If you go to the parentlearningclub.com website, under webinars, you'll see uh, the webinar, uh, Love Between Parents, uh, Helping Parents Resolve Different Parenting Styles uh, and Dealing with the Differences. And that's a, that's a big subject there. So um, there, but there's some key points to make it uh, really effective. So I recommend you to, to check out that webinar recording. Okay, so Disha asks, in the beginning of your book, it says there are a few bonuses. Uh, I sent a copy of Amazon. Okay, oh, so you haven't received these bonuses? Well, they're definitely available. So Disha, um, if uh, perhaps sometimes the emails do get lost along the way, I apologize for that. Just send us another email to support parentlearningclub.com. Try it one more time. 
Uh, I apologize for the delay. I'll make sure that, uh, that, that Mary gets on that and sends you a reply as soon as possible. Okay, another question. The only punishment or way I can get through to my son is by taking things away. Um, he is 10 and for him it's electronics. It temporarily resolves problems but as soon as he gets them back his behavior starts again. What is the proper t amount of time to take away privileges? It's a, as if he waits for it to get his privilege back, be it electronics or whatever, and then the bad behavior starts all over again. This is a continuous battle. Exactly. You're 100% right. Removing privileges is a form of punishment, and punishments is a short-term, ineffective solution to a deeper issue. So the only reason you'd want to take away privileges is if the difficult behavior is associated to the misuse of whatever it is they have privilege to. In other words, if, you know, he's surfing, if he has a, an electronic uh, a laptop and he's surfing websites that he shouldn't be, okay, he's crossed the limit. At that point, you can remove that privilege because it's within there. It's like the example I gave around the trampoline use. They cross the limit within the context of that privilege, so the privilege was lost. That's a, what I call a natural consequence with our help. We're, we're re, re, reinforcing the limit and they're getting the natural consequence of them not respecting a limit that they already know. With a 10-year-old, he knows better at this point. And so, so the, uh, but if you're removing the, the privilege of the electronics for other type of behavior, then it's just a form of punishment and he's not going to respect that. So um, you need to look at what's the deeper issues, why he's not behaving that way, and to deal, to face those limits head on. Okay, so if uh, whatever the behavior is doing, you need to just uh, stop the limit there. Stop using the removal of privileges and punishments because it's just completely ineffective. You need to find another way to capture his attention and to get his respect. Okay, um, and, but because, because like you said, it's a continuous battle that goes nowhere. So you might want to review some of the guidelines in this webinar or uh, get that free coaching call with me so we can talk about some of the deeper issues or talk about the specific behavior problem that you're dealing with and I can give you a hand to try and find, find a solution to that. Renell, I would like a no TV policy during the week and on the weekend sometimes, but the kids see this as an unreasonable. I explain to them that it cuts their time. Is it this diplomatic for me to just set this fair limit even though they can see it as unfair? Of course, right? Oftentimes when we set limits, the children uh, around specific things uh, uh, around their health, right, or other limits that are for their own good, um, they might not understand that uh, ba based upon their understanding of the world or their um, what you know what uh, uh, their their level of thinking. So they they might just feel that as unfair. So the um, uh, the by telling them that it cuts into their time, then that's that's speaking to them in a way that they probably don't understand because for them they probably think it's a, it's it's time well spent. Instead, you might just say, sweet, you know, guy, I just don't want you uh, watching uh, TV on the, uh, during the week and uh, on these times. So instead of saying that, you know, you can say instead of cutting out the time and saying you can't watch it then, you can reinforce the time that they can watch it. Say, you know, you can watch uh, TV for two hours on Saturday and two hours on Sunday or one hour on Sunday. Whatever it is, whatever the limit you decide, you can just reinforce, say, that's when we watch TV. And other times, and then if they say, well, I want to watch it now. How come we can't watch it now? It's not fair. My friend Melissa gets to watch it whenever she wants and, you know, giving you all kinds of reasons and trying to basically convince you to, to, um, to be more flexible on that limit. So to reinforce and to stand behind that limit, you can just say, um, I understand, guys. It's, you know, I understand your frustration and everything. But uh, we're going to watch, the only time that we watch TV is during this time. Other times you can, you can do this and you can do that and you can basically, this is an opportunity for you to redirect their attention towards something else. And what you can also do is try and make it fun. You can say, well, how about we do something else? Or, you know, how about we do this now and engage their enthusiasm in some other type of activity. Just redirect their attention any way you can. And you might have to continuously deal with this uh, objection of theirs. And then after a time, they'll just grow to accept it more and more. But don't, don't, don't be surprised if it does pop up once now and again because they're, they're just trying to test it. Uh, they might just test to see if it might have changed for you. So um, 
So that's what I would say is just stand behind it if that's a limit you want to reinforce. Um, Erica says, thank you so much for your response to my question and for your webinar. It more than lived up to my hopeful expectations. Oh, that's wonderful, Eric. I'm glad that it was helpful. Renell says, for a couple who had a history of arguing with ch uh, children present uh, and children being affected by this thinking their parents don't like each other, how does a couple promote reconnection within the family since the arguing stopped but kids may still be affected? Should kids go to therapy or is it enough to practice uh, democratic parenting to get the family back on track? A lot of parental disconnection arguing had to do with a bad parenting, either too permissive or, or over overprotective or authoritarian. Great question. Again, I recommend you get the uh, Love Between Parents uh, webinar. It's on the parentlearningclub.com. Um, that, that gives you some uh, detail about uh, the relationship between parents with different parenting styles. And um, the other thing that you want to remember is that children are incredibly buoyant. I would just leave it. Um, you know, they might not need therapy, but uh, they, it could be useful. It's, uh, it's dependent upon every child in every situation. So, but otherwise, if you just start to mirror that good connection and relationship with the, with the, between the parents now, your children will start to feed on that, and the positivity that will come from that will more than nourish them, more than help them heal and get over the difficult period that you might have gone through before. And you might want to talk about, about it with them. Uh, you know, it, it, again, it depends upon what type of behavior and how they're manifesting um, that, that type of issue that might have come up from that. Okay, uh, Renell says, thank you so much. I have to meet my daughter at the bus stop, and I hope I could listen to this later again. You certainly will, Renell. This is being recorded, and it will be uploaded for everybody to listen to uh, as many times as you want. Uh, just like all of our webinars at uh, Parent Learning Club, you can get lifetime access to them after you uh, initially purchase a ticket for them. Okay, a couple more questions here. Um, Zara asks, I have an adult child who is a bad example to my other children coming home late using marijuana, how can I remove them away from that? Great question. Not an easy situation. So the best thing to do would be to, um, to uh, have a conversation with your adult child. Do use the family meeting protocol, but perhaps just do it with your adult child. Um, you know, and the, the thing is, in order to get through to, to a child, or really an adult as well, uh, is, to, is to apply the principles of connective communication. Build that connection. Uh, ask them questions. Be interested. Uh, you know, never make them feel um, condescended or anything like that. And uh, the child, the adult child, might be resistant. Um, you know, but uh, to the, because if they're using drugs, their their ability, their good judgment, their thinking might be impaired, and they might be resistant as well. And oftentimes, uh, using marijuana or other substances is a way for them to deal with uh, deeper feelings. Um, and when we challenge them on their behavior, sometimes those feelings can get triggered and they become more defensive. So uh, the best thing to do with an adult child using marijuana or anything, or even if they're not on drugs, and you, we want to get them back on track to re-inspire them towards a better outcome, is to ask them uh, to be more interested. Find times that you can just be connected with them. Do activities with them. Whatever their interest is, uh, you know, find a way that you can start to participate in that. That builds up the rapport and the connection and makes you uh, more influenceable in their lives. And then that, that's the first step. Build a connection so you can be a uh, stronger influence. And then start to ask them questions. Find out what their motivations are, what their dreams are, what, they, what inspires them, what they'd like to do, what they'd like to accomplish in their life, what their life goals are. Get them inspired and motivated. Okay, so that's the other thing. You need them to look towards a direction towards something. Then, so we've gone through two steps. First, connect, then first connect to them, build a rapport with them, build their trust. Second, find out what their goals, their visions, or their hopes, and their dreams are. Then third, ask them questions that can help them uh, align their actions with their goals, right? Ask them, you know, how they can get there, what they need to do to get there. And, you know, at some point, if you build up the strong connection and you your practice using this connective communication, you can ask them, uh, you know, more challenging questions and say, well, you know, do you think that coming home late or you know going to your friend's place, playing video games, or you know, smoking marijuana, 
um, is helping you achieve to get to your goal of such and such, being a lawyer or being a, an athlete, whatever it may be. And um, you know, they'll just they'll, they have to be honest, right? They'll be honest with you. They might be upset that you bring it up, but that's asking them the questions, planting them a seed, so that they can start to to challenge their own incongruency and maybe make better choices. The important thing is, is, is maintain that connection, right? You don't want to say anything that disconnects uh, further from the child because then that your ability to influence them will decrease and, they're, um, and then they'll start to seek uh, connection and their needs from other uh, people or uh, peers that might not be the best influences or models in their life. So. Um, so that's one way to kind of reach through to them. And then you might, uh, and then at that point too, um, you can also, once you have a connection with them, um, if you do a family meeting, you can also just say to them, you know, sweetheart, I love you, and, um, you know, I encourage you towards your dreams, and I want you to, I want you just to be happy and healthy. You know that I'm concerned already about your habits a little bit, and I just want to uh, let you know that, um, for the younger children, I need to uh, I need to help them um, and be the responsible parent with them. So I just need to uh, create a limit here in how you're going to show up around them, uh, you know. And then just set a limit, whatever it might be. Maybe say, you know, um, you know, I need you home before now, or you need to find your your own house, you know. So this, again, this is a difficult situation. Um, we don't want to push them farther away, but sometimes we need to set a firm limit to get them back on track. And that's really the balance of how to set that. So I'd recommend, Zara, that you take me up as well on this free coaching call and I can uh, find out a few more details to figure out what's going on underneath that and, and help you find a solution to, uh, to, to dealing with this situation. Because this isn't easy and there's lots of, lots of things at play. It depends, you know, how your, the, your adult child is, um, is interfe interfering and what behavior that they're showing, what they're saying that is influencing the younger ch children, and the different circumstances that can allow uh, different limits in this situation. So uh, I would recommend strongly that you take me up on this free coaching call and I can perhaps help you find some solutions that way. Kadisha asks if I'm familiar with conscious um, discipline. Uh, conscious discipline. Sounds familiar? Well, Conscious discipline. I'm not sure how that's used exactly, but I would say that um, you know that the democratic uh, parenting style of discipline could be e as easily called conscious discipline. You know, as I was writing this book um, and, and working, uh, you know, I've been working with the Parent Learning Club website for a number of years now. And um, when I was writing the democratic parenting book for a long time, I didn't, I wasn't sure about what to call it, what to call this type of discipline, what to call this type of parenting. And I was resistant to the democratic parenting name for a long time because some people thought it sounded too political. And it's, and it's quite confusing for a lot of people. They think, well, does it mean that my child can vote? What is, what's democratic parenting? And so these are questions I get all the time. And really, democratic parenting and discipline has nothing to do with uh, with voting or anything like that. It really just means about how to allow the child to have more choice over their behavior. You see, a lot of children's behavior is ruled by these deeper um, drives, these unmet needs, these root causes of their behavior. And so even children have a hard time controlling their own behavior when these drives and these emotions are motivating them underneath that. So by dealing with the root causes, meeting their needs, helping them resolve their, resolve their stress, and heal from their stress and emotional hurts, it frees up their attention. It frees up their consciousness so they can think more clearly and so that they have better judgment and so that they have choice over their own behavior. Right? And that's really where this democracy comes from, this, the, the idea of democratic parenting. It's really about playing with power. Right? I talked about this webinar, the hidden power struggle between parents and children. Well, the thing is, is that the need for power of the, which comes from uh, autonomy is an inherent instinctual need we all have. Now, democratic parenting allows children to learn to play with that power, to become responsible with their own inherent, in, in, uh, inherent power that they have. We don't dominate the power like authoritarian parents. We don't, don't give the children all the power like permissive parents. Instead, 
we teach children how to be responsible with the power that they have and how to share power within a family, within an environment where multiple needs are at play, and how to, how to help children have clear thinking and good judgment around how to assess all the needs and how to create win-win-win solutions for everybody and everything that's involved in any given situation. And that's what really democratic parenting is all about. Okay, so that looks like all the questions we have today. So thank you so much for joining me on this webinar. It was a pleasure and honor to spend this time with you and to share this information. And um, there's more resources at the Parent Learning Club website. We'll be doing more live webinars, and there's lots of webinar recordings on specific issues if uh, you're curious about those. We also have some e-courses like the Parent Leadership Program and the uh, Attention Deficit Disorder, the ADHD Transformation Program, as well as many others that are going to be coming out soon. So remember, every single day, give your child all your love. Give yourself that same love, too, and together we can build a brighter future.